Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and I'm speaking with Audrey Waters, the weekly hack education podcast. Hi, Audrey. Hello. It's April 6th, 2012. So fun to be reading again. So you're off vacation. So a little bit more reading this week. A little bit more, you know, getting back in the saddle and um, sort of rolling with the punches as um, another week of very interesting uh, news um, in the education space. So there you go. Yes, I really enjoyed uh, the reading this week. The f- The first piece on education's journalism problem, mm-hmm. I, um, I'm that was the one I was the least sure I understood your point of. So uh, do you want to kind of give us an overview of what you're communicating in that post? Well, I should say that it, it probably actually connects in a lot of ways to the last post, that, the one that I wrote yesterday, which was about um, my rejection from the Columbia University <laughs> journalism mm. school <laughs> for a fellowship program. I, just, I had applied to the Spencer Education Journalism Fellowship Program and, and uh, got my rejection early, uh, rejection letter earlier this week. Um, and, and, you know, as I was sort of thinking about what, it, what is it that the story, what are, what are the stories that we're telling right now uh, in the media about education? Um, uh, who's telling them? And what are these sort of overarching narratives that um, that may or may not actually dovetail with people's um, with people's sort of um, personal experiences around around uh, school. Um, and so earlier this week or over the weekend, um, in the um, American Journalism Review, was a piece um, that really uh, uh, heavily critiqued the the way in which e- education journalism um, operates. So it it the the piece um, by Paul Farhi talked about how. Um, how the mainstream mainstream media is really uh, fixated on this notion of failing schools, um, and the this the sort of the the stories that keep getting told are about how American schools are failing. We're failing. The test scores are falling. We're not keeping up. We're um, and I felt as though that was an interest. The the his critique was in, was timed at an interesting moment where another story that we touched touched upon last week as well. The story out of the Atlanta Journal Constitution about cheating schools. So they'd found some anomalous uh, test score data and sort of made this conclusion that that meant that cheating was that uh, cheating was everywhere. And it just struck me as this. That, we're, that there are these certain narratives that we're just hearing about again and again in school ab- about schools that um, that really don't seem to necessarily dovetail with what people are experiencing. Whether you know whether um, whether your sort of individual experience is about that sort of school is awesome or your individual experience is you know schools schools aren't so awesome. So and I so think, think that I think I'm too you know sort of tied up in that was just thinking myself about the sort of stories that the sort of stories that I'm telling and how they may or may not fit in with the larger the larger narratives that the media tells about education. You're concerned about sort of this educational alarmism, mm-hmm. right? And, and that the measure of success in the journalism would be the number of page views and the hype, right? Is there kind of a deeper a connection here to um, this sort of larger story of our school system not necessarily um, putting a premium on building critical thinking. And so is this sort of part of a larger picture of education and even the reporting on education kind of falling into the superficial level? Well, that, I mean, that's certainly what I feel as though, you know, and when, when I, you know, when I found the, the American Journalism Review piece really fascinating and it's, you know, because I actually do think that there that our school system is facing, um, you know, a number of crises, and I would point I would actually point to um, sort of our fixation on standardized testing as as being um, one of the one of the problems that we're facing. One of the reasons why we we actually aren't really focused on creative problem solving, crit- critical thinking, is because we're really focused on on the standardized testing in math and in writing. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that the, that the policy and the rhetoric around what school means has become wrapped up in how well you're scoring on these particular tests. And I think a lot of these other conversations get lost in the mix. And there and they're, and they're, they're are conversations about the ways in which schools meet, meet kids' needs and don't meet kids' needs. But the one measure that we're looking at is how well kids are performing on standardized tests. And that's, you know... 
I think that that's a, that's a fixation at a policy level that's now we're seeing um, that fixation in, in the media as well. When, you know, I don't, I don't know if, pa- I mean, I think that, you know, I, I think that it would be really hard to tell, <laughs> I mean, I would think, you know, until, until the culture changes, it's actually really hard to sort of see your third grader take, you know, spend, spend a week doing standardized testing and the angst and the anxiety that comes with that and really feel as though that's, you know, it, it's hard to sort of tell your third grader that, that that really, that really is the important thing that they should be care, that they should be fixated on. You know, it's really interesting because it's very hard to suss out the difference between um, uh, uh, um, confusion over the educational narratives that comes with sort of the openness now and the ability of many more people to have voice in the conversation versus what's truly happening. I mean, are we seeing things that we haven't seen maybe in forever because we now have this ability to communicate and talk to each other in ways that we didn't before? Or are we at the tail end of an historical period where schooling has really transformed into test taking? I, I, you know, I feel a little confused about the, the actual moment we're in. But I think that that's actually really interesting. And I, I mean, I, you know, I think that when you think about how education reporting is often done, too, I mean, I think that there are the local, you know, your local interest and they often are local interest stories. I mean, sometimes they are local politics stories, but they're often local interest stories about neighborhood schools um, and whatnot. Versus now, these these um, uh, and how does it? How does what? How does a local interest story now become a main? T- you know, a major national story. I mean, I think the example that we talked about last week of that uh, young man who was expelled for tweeting is sort of one of those stories that would have been a local interest story ten years ago. Well pre-Twitter, but you know what I mean, like someone ex- being expelled for school um, would have been a, probably a local a local story, and now that story um, becomes national news, and you know, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about, um, using that as a, as a lens to think about um, surveillance and discipline um, at, at a broad level, as well as just in our, in our you know, in our sons, in our sons and daughters' uh, classrooms. That's really interesting. Without diving too deeply into that old story, I thought I read this week that they determined that he wasn't actually going through the school network. Has there been more news on that story of the the young man? If there has been, I haven't heard about it, but I'll have to look and see because I think that that's um, I think that you know you know this is something that we've touched upon enough to know that these questions these questions of uh, these questions of surveillance of the network I think are uh, and and students' First Amendment rights um, are are important. Yes, and if you really want to dive deeply into this, read the last chapter of Howard Rheingold's new book, Net Smart, because <laughs> he talks about this and the temptation with the surveillance tools to use them in ways that we, we really have to be thinking about deeply. Okay, so Audrey, does everybody want a program or does nobody want a program? This is, I, I, what's going on? Well, this is funny because I think that, you know, on one hand, we're – there. There are all these different narratives going on now um, about whether or not everyone should program. Uh, does everyone want to program? And what is ex- what exactly does that what exactly does that look like? What exactly do people want to know, and what do people need to know? Um, and uh, it's just it's interesting to me to sort of watch sort of different different communities and different pockets respond to things. So Hacker News, for example, is a is a website um, where a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, developers um, go. It's connected with Y Combinator, the Silicon Valley um, tech incubator. So there's a lot of discussion there about community tech, the, the community news from the from the tech from the tech world, and talk about talk about um, programming. And so it was interesting to see what what the what sort of young developers that's uh, price stereotyping. What developers say on Hacker News when they talk about learning to program versus what um, you know educators think about in terms of learning to program um, and then now there's sort of this new story thanks to code uh, things in part to code academy and their new year's resolution code year that suddenly everybody wants to learn to program and um, it seems to all sort of as we start to scrutinize it what you know what does that mean what are people learning and what do people want to learn and why um, it, it becomes a lot less clear um, and I think that you know my own experiences with Code Academy are a fairly, I think, a fairly typical example of sort of 
you know, what, what, you know, what exactly, how exactly are we going to get people um, developing the skills that they want, and what exactly do those skills even entail? It's, it's not, it's not clear that anyone has the answer to this. Oh, I, I feel so much more clarity. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm still in the same boat. I did really love the advice, though, about avoiding drag and drop and keeping code copyable. Yes. I, I was interested that I responded so strongly to that. Well, and I think that that's, you know, I think that that's one of the things that when when you think about um, what it is that, or the ways in which, um, whether you're a professional software engineer or um, someone like myself who I, I was saying, I, I, hack, I hack at things rather than having sort of... Um, um, sort of having a, a formal schooling in it, um, the ability to the ability to be able to copy and paste easily share and easily share what I do and you you know look at you know peel back the layer look at what other people have coded and um, sort of reverse engineer it I think is really important. So once you black black box things through a drag and drop interface perhaps or make things um, impossible to be copied, I think that's a real detriment to real detriment to learners being able to tinker tinker and, and do things on their own. It's hard not to feel like at the core of these stories on programming is um, agency and self-initiative. Um, you know, from the programmers who really end up going on and becoming programmers to uh, just sort of simple hacking to get things done. And I wonder if this isn't really a deeper story of um, motivation Mm-hmm. around all subjects rather than just programming, but it happens to be that we get to talk about it with programming. I think, uh, I think it could be a question of motivation, but I actually think that issue of agency is really, is really important. And when we think about um, agency as learners, but also agency as sort of um, digital citizens and what it means to sort of build, make, and control your own um, well, uh, your own domain, right? Um, but but your own your presence your presence um, uh, online, I think is I think that that agency piece that comes with programming is really fundamental. I mean, we talk a lot about it's in terms of literacy, but that I mean that is you know literacy that affords, affords agency as well. And so I think that that's why, it, to me at least, it's it's so incredibly important. It's less about it's less to me about you know, building this sort of future employ- class of sort of employable um, people with, you know, with high tech skills than it has, is about giving people actual agency um, to be able to, you know, to be fully participate, to fully participate in the world around them. Okay, this Minerva project. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wanted to hate this story. <laughs> But then every once in a while, there were pieces of it where I actually thought, oh, my gosh, this is intriguing. Uh, so the, the hate part is the elitism and the sort of the uh, what, I, what felt to me like the con- kind of copying existing narratives into a new environment. But then there was this other part of students gathering all over the world uh, in, a, in a very different form of university that I actually loved. Yeah, that, you know... I, I share that same sort of mixed mixed reaction to to this story. Um, and I think, and I think for similar reasons. I, I think that when we, you know, uh, when when you think about the the interest in an elite in an elite university education, right? I think that I think that by that that sort of code for the Ivy League schools plus um, Oxford and Cambridge. So, you know, what does it what what do we mean by by that brand name is that about churning out um, uh, you know highly critical thinkers and well-educated young men and women, or is that about something else that comes that's a, that's often associated with um, economic class and political connection you know political connections? Um, so I, and I, I I mean I think that for me that's sort of I'm interested in sort of that that elitism part is um, problem problematic. So this is not a cheap experience. Oh, cheaper than Stanford University, right? This is well. They're saying twenty thousand dollars a year, which we'll. I mean, we'll see if actually that we'll see if actually that price holds true. Because I have a hard time imagining how you would take um, a sophomore class and move them to you know to Shanghai or Berlin to to study. Uh, 
to, to live, you know, is, or I should say, is that, is that dorm experience that they're talking about, that global dorm experience, is that an extra fee? Probably. You know, but this leads me in so many interesting ways. I mean, okay, so I don't like the $20,000. You, well, you've got dorm fees, you've got other, other fees, but I love the idea that you could actually hold some kind of a thing and say, okay, everybody who wants to participate in the sophomore year, find somewhere to live in Shanghai. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and and we'll meet there. I mean, it seems like it does. Just the thought of rethinking education in this way excited me. Now, there's a lot of money invested here, right? Yes, there's a lot of money. The twenty five million dollars in seed funding, right? So, seed funding is the first round. This is the first uh, funding that a, that a company raises, and so. The, the, and you know, as the as the name suggests, this is because this is the seed of an idea. They're, they are saying that this is that they'll be ready to matriculate in 2014, and, and we shall see. I mean, there's a lot of things that have to fall into place to get a school up and running, um, you know, in in 18 months' time. Um, one of the pieces that was really interesting to me was this was this argument that um, that the that the CEO made that they wouldn't offer any classes that you could find online for free. Um, so they wouldn't offer, he said, they wouldn't offer, you won't find any foreign language courses, you wouldn't find any introductory courses, they would expect students to do that work on their own, and then the classes that they'd pay for at the university would be of a high caliber, of a higher caliber um, um, of rigor, which um, perhaps, perhaps more akin to what you'd find in, in grad school today. And I thought that, that was a, to me, that was a really interesting uh, idea um, I didn't like it well, as, I, well as, a, as a liberal arts graduate that English class my freshman year was the most rigorous well that's well that's what I thought was really interesting is it to me that makes a lot of assumptions about what like what we value in terms of content and the question that I kept coming back over uh, as I had over and over and over again when I talked to the CEO was like what Matt what like really what we're, what are we talking about are we talking about knowledge acquisition or are we talk about talking about the process of the process of learning and what do we what do we want you know there's a lot of concern now we talk about you know kids are graduating college and they don't quote know anything um, but it is it is the knowing something what matters or is it, is it the ability to have the problem solving critical thinking skills that you can sort of learn more, learn anything you want uh, in the future. And so there, to me, this, this, this was this really interesting stance that this project is making that, that, um, that, that, that they didn't see any value in what they felt was this sort of introductory knowledge, that they had some other layer baked on top that they were going to, where they were going to sort of add the, this exceptional value that involved um, you know, in, in, being intellectually rig rigorous, creative problem thinkers, problem solvers, um, that, that you wouldn't find, for some reason, you are not going to find in a foreign language class. And as someone who, you know, speaks three foreign languages, I, was, I think that's intellectually rigorous, but that's beside the point. Uh, you know who I'd want to hear from here is Cal Newport, because it just didn't add up for me that this idea you'd use the existing admissions process to find students. Well, the students who are going to be the ones who could do the self-introductory courses on their own are probably not the same ones who are getting admitted to typical universities these days. It felt like there was a little bit of a disconnect for me on that. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, that's, the, to this, this project was, was really fascinating because it seemed to have so many of the narratives that, that I'm hearing a lot around Silicon Valley about the value or and or lack of value of, of a higher education degree. Sort of, so one of the things that the Minerva Project promises is that, is that it's going to have sort of a, a better um, a better alumni network at, than the typical college, where the only thing you leave, you know, the way they put it, positioned it was that you know typically you you graduate with a piece of paper and then you know. Uh, $100,000 in student loan debt. In this case, you're going to graduate into this really strong network of mentors and potential employers and these other connections, which, again, is, I think, the promise that something like Harvard offers. Um, but, again, you know, how how do you build, you know, how do you, so how do you sort of build that from scratch? Um, what does, you know, what does that actually look like? And the kinds of students that would gravitate to 
and, and, and thrive in a program like this? Um, it, you know, why, why, would, why, would, why would the Minerva project, particularly untested, be the route that they would take? Yeah, I'd love to see the evidence of that. But it does seem like kind of a bold claim that doesn't necessarily make sense given both the stage of the school yeah. and, and the structure. <laughs> um, no, no, totally. uh, you, do, you obviously were careful not to, to jump on this too brutally, but the best faculty end up being those unemployed PhDs? Well, that, that, I, th this, was, this was a really interesting one to me, too, is because I, I, you know, I think having you know having taught um, having taught for eight years at a university, I think that you know the, and then thinking about what are the how do you what what does that mean to to move from the from the classroom online? I had questions about when you talk about the best teachers, what are, you know what support do you give them to think about what that means in terms of teaching teaching online too, um, and. I, you know, I said, so where, where are these great teachers? And where, again, much like where are you going to find the students? Where are you going to find the, the faculty that are willing to, to, to join, to join the university? And he was, <laughs> he was pretty insistent that the, you know, that the job market is so awful right now that they won't have any problem finding highly qualified PhDs. And that is probably true that they're, you know, they're, I, you know, speaking from, you know, all the friends I know who, who finish their PhDs, very few of them are, have tenure track jobs. They're working as adjuncts. Um, but, you know, will the Minerva Project offer a, um, a, a career path for those people? Again, I, d I don't know. I think it's making some big assumptions that it, that it will or, or, or that it won't. You know, there's an interesting parallel here with uh, BYU-Idaho. Anya Kamenetz profiled them in her DIYU book and actually called and did an interview with them. And they don't do any research. It's only teaching. And that's a kind of an intriguing model and a good one. And so there may be something behind what he's saying, where if you don't have the research portion and you're just focusing on getting good teachers, they might be successful that way. Yeah, they might be. I mean, I think that, the, you know, I think that they're, it's tough. I mean, I think that some of my favorite professors um, were great teachers and good researchers. So I'm not sure that there's an either or. It's, you know, and it's, and again, I don't, you know, I don't know. There was, there's been some discussion lately about sort of what to profess. There was a really awful sort of op-ed in the Washington Post a week or two ago that sort of professors don't work very hard and, you know, they only teach, you know, two or three classes a week. That's, you know, that's like eight hours. What, you know, what the heck do they do all day? And, um, and I, I, you know, I don't, the, the, this question around academic labor and adjunct labor is, is another really interesting one. I mean, is the Minerva Project um, a solution to that? Or is this, is it taking advantage of sort of already a really bad situation for, um, for, for people who work at that level? Well, whatever it is, the story does a really good job of opening some very interesting doors. Yes. Okay, so prep you and another adaptive learning company with ties to an education publisher and the promise that lots of data will solve things. Am I oversimplifying? No, that's, I mean, I think that this is, this is something that we're seeing um, a lot of, this connection between um, some of these old tra traditional, uh, traditional publishers. I mean, as I, I talked to the folk person from Macmillan, he reminded me that the, the company has been around 170 years. So this is an old, this is an old company that's now sort of seeing, arguably seeing the handwriting on the wall that with a move towards sort of digital, um, digital curriculum, digital material, and the, the, the pressure to build an adaptive learning engine to help deliver that content um, efficiently. And I use, I use those words purposefully here, although that's not off, that's not how I choose to describe teaching and learning, but I think that the, what they're doing is thinking about how do you c deliver content efficiently um, to, to students. And that's called, you know, I think that uh, we should, you know, question whether or not we, we think that that's really what we would want to call personalized learning, but certainly that's what this, be, that's what this is being um, touted as. Um, lots of interesting data here. I mean, I think that there are lots of interesting Lots of interesting questions about, you know, what, what can we glean about what students know and don't know um, based on their computer interactions. Um, but I think that despite this being actually something that folks have been working on for decades now, the technology really isn't there yet to be able to say you can adapt 
these systems to, to individual students' needs. The tweetable quote from you is that um, these seem to be interested in the fixed knowing and not in the open learning. Right. Yeah, and I think you know, and I think that this gets complicated too. Is this is the, what the the program that that Prep U now offers is associated with the AP exam, and you know how much again, how much are we fixated by these these standardized tests and these scores that we're using to dictate. Um, students' uh, academic achievement, and you know, uh, John Burke, who's a physics teacher in Georgia, has written a lot about a lot about the AP exam. Sort of, the, he calls it the arms, like you know, the college admissions arms race, and what's getting lost in the classroom. It, and we should note, you know, this is these are advanced. The, the APs are supposed to be advanced. These are advanced classes, right? These are supposed to be for the call the students who are headed to college, who are ready to do college level work their senior year. And what's getting lost when we're focused on test scores for some of these bright, some of these brightest students? Um, and you know, again, are these are these adaptive quizzing machines sort of are they are they a solution to some of that, or are they actually sort of exacerbating exacerbating the problem where we're fixated on uh, fixated on the knowing? Right. Again, uh, a red herring. <laughs> so, the, you know, the interesting piece here being that my eighth grader is already concerned about whether or not she's going to get into the AP classes in high school. Not because she cares about the subjects, but because she's being told the narrative that you have to have those AP classes to get into college. Yep. And the you know, and my I remember my son being that age too and the and the and the and the the lot there the, the sort of chain of equivalencies were if I don't get in if I don't take advanced algebra in middle school then I won't get into the AP classes in high school then I won't get into college then I'll end up unemployed or homeless working at you know working at Taco Bell like that's the, <laughs> that's the narrative that Isaiah would stress about and when he was you know twelve. But that's the addictiveness of a system. Right. Right. I mean, it is. It is. It, it is addictive. It's appealing. It's attractive. Uh, it's something that we can put our energies into because it exists, and we feel like there's a quantifiable output. Yeah. Um, now, was there? A, did you cite an example of a study that showed that it was possible that uh, the AP courses were actually um, those students who had scored higher in the AP courses were actually having more trouble in their college? Yeah. Course? I mean, that's that's been that's what. Um uh, Eric Mazzura has found at Harvard is that some of the highest scoring, some of the students that come in with having scored the highest on uh, on AP exams actually perform poorly once they get to college. And you know, I think again, it raises questions about are you are you helping students have sort of is it about the, you know the process of learning or is it about the product you know the pro the knowledge product? And when you put too much emphasis on being able to, you know, being able to sort of recite those facts to score well on the AP exam, how much are you losing in terms of really a deep conceptual understanding of, of any of that subject matter? Worthwhile. Thank you for that. Okay, so if there was a story that you wrote this week where I wanted to scream, yeah, it was free textbook startup sued by major publishers for copyright infringement. This is and I actually, yeah. I actually wanted to scream twice in this story. <laughs> no, this is a this is a really actually this is a this is a really important story um, that uh, for for a lot of reasons, and it's one that I sat stewing about how to how to frame my take on it. Um, for a long time, and I should back up and say that this, you know, Boundless Learning is a it's a startup out of Boston, and it's a startup that I've been hearing a lot of buzz about for quite some time from you know various folks I know saying, um, you should check them out, you should see what they're doing, they're doing something interesting, and I sort of sent email and um, they said though they don't weren't ready to talk to me yet, which is after the Audrey test. <laughs> 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 I, I'm getting that a lot these days. But finally, this week, I got a very sort of emergency sort of message saying, we've got big news tomorrow. Can you hop on the phone right, right away? Um, and I did. And it was, and um, I was really surprised to hear this news um, about the lawsuit. And my first reaction was, I think, and the reaction that I've seen from a lot of people on Twitter and whatnot is, you know, this is another indication that the major, the major, major textbook publishers are feeling 
um, are feeling the pinch by OER, are feeling threatened, they're not innovating, and they're going to sue the, you know, sue a startup into oblivion. Uh, and I think the story is actually a lot more complicated than that and a lot more troubling than that for a number of reasons, uh, least of which being I'm, just, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not actually really sure um, what, le what boundless learning was, was building. Um, I actually wondered reading the story if the suit doesn't have merit. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I've included the the actual complaint, the 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 complaint from so it's Pearson, uh, Sengage, and Macmillan that are suing for the three their three sort of their three big well known textbooks. Right, Campbell's Biology is what Pearson is is um, claiming copyright infringement on, which is uh, by and large the number one college you know college level biology textbook. Um, and they're pretty detailed, saying that that um, boundless, um, not copied word for word, but has certainly um, copied the the chat, the sort of the order of the book, the topics, the sub the subheadings, gone so far as to sort of use the same uh, images and explanations um, throughout the the book. And I think that if you look at you know, if you look at what boundless learning was offering, they were making it pretty clear that they were offering you, they were offering students a free version of, of in this case, sort of Campbell's biology, um, is you know, uh, and saying that the and couching this in terms of open education resources. So basically, the concern is not that they copied the content necessarily, but they copied the structure, the right. Topics, the subtopics, and actually, sort of in a sad way, could see this happening. And matched and matched it page for page too. I mean, so that so that if you if your if your professor said, "I would like you to read page you know 138 through 157 for tomorrow," that you could use your your boundless learning copy, and it would be paginated the same way. So we. We and do a fair amount of criticizing this is the financial. Complaint. Go ahead. This is the compl I mean, you know, this is the complaint that, uh, according to, according to to the textbook companies, right. I should say. And we've done our fair share of criticizing financially driven companies for using that power um, as part of a, you know, a competing interest narrative that often doesn't feel like it serves education well. In this particular case, I kind of came away thinking, oh, "I'm sorry, but it sounds like maybe they did violate here." Yeah, I mean, I think to me this is really troubling because I, you know, I am a huge proponent of open education resources, and I'm actually, I'm actually pretty skeptical about the notion of copyright. Rob Reynolds wrote a really interesting piece on um, illiterate Michael uh, Michael Felsing's blog today, and like asking, like really, I mean, asking some good questions about how much of general ed. It's, is copyrightable. I mean, these are, you know, if you look at any college-level biology book, textbook, they do probably all cover the same, roughly cover, cover the same topics. They do sort of take, they do sort of take you through the same set of material based on the assumption that most, you know, biology 101 syllabus, syllabi are going to, you know, cover the same basics. So how, how much of that is, is copyrightable? But that, to me, that's, that's a philosophical question. I think legally, um, you know, I think, I, I, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I think legally there are some really interesting questions here. I mean, certainly facts aren't copyrightable. Um, recipe books actually aren't copyrightable. Is, is a textbook just a recipe book? Uh, that's an interesting question. Is there, is there anything original and unique about a textbook? I don't know. Um, I think we could we could probably argue that maybe maybe there isn't, but I think that what boundless learning has done to me at least, even if it's not copyright infringement, it certainly smacks of plagiarism, um, that which isn't a crime. But academic dishonesty is certainly nothing that I would want associated with an education startup. And so I think my you know my concerns are: did they do something that was that would count as academic dishonesty and in, in a classroom? And I think passing off someone's work as your own in that sort of way, uh, it, to me, it's, it's looked like plagiarism. There's always more to a story than we get at the first glance. But so we'll, I guess we'll be watching this one unfold. Right. And I should note, you know, this, is, this, company, this company also announced this week that they'd raised $8 million. 
They have investors that are backing them in this fight, and they actually have some really great advisors for the I startup know. too. So I don't know what I mean. I really don't know. I don't know what happened here, and I don't know what you know what else we don't know behind the scenes. And um, but it, the whole the whole thing sort of seems really troubling to me in the way it could play out for OER. Um, and uh, you know what else? What else will happen? What else will happen when when the courts scrutinize? Um, scrutinize these questions because I think that um, it, you know, the, a college college textbooks do tend to look look a lot alike. And does does Pearson get to sort of claim copyright on on that material because they are because they sort of uh, because they have this really popular and uh, influential book? Lots of lots of questions here. Yeah, so could one dictionary say to another, you can't put those words in that order because we did it first, if in fact there's a general consensus as to the order of the teaching? I, I think the harder part was sort of the, ma- the, the sort of the identical matching. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't look so <laughs> <laughs> that that doesn't look so good for the startup. But I, but you know, but then I, you know, the way that legal precedents work, what ha- what happens when a company that says that their OER gets sued for copyright infringement? You know, how does that influence what's happening with with OER in general? Even though I, I mean, you know, I think you know, I, I I just you know wonder what the what the repercussions are going to be when these things happen. Okay, so two weeks ago, in a move that I am not proud of, that reflects my lack of skill skiing, I broke my shoulder in two places, and. I thought, well, should I even post about this or put it up somewhere? And I thought, oh, you know, that's really kind of private. That's not <laughs> something anybody needs to hear about. You go ahead and talk about the fact that you got rejected from a. I mean, this is like sort of opening your life up here. Well, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think that you know, I I think that it's I mean, I'm I, I was sort of inspired by a lot of ways by George Siemens, who a month or so ago wrote a similar post that he'd applied for, I think, a research position somewhere and got rejected. And and uh, and it sort of posted his proposal online for feedback because I think, you know, when, when you have um, partially sort of, I mean, I like to be I like to be transparent with my ideas and with what I'm thinking about. And it seems even if the, you know, even if the Columbia School of Journalism didn't think much about the idea, I've, you know, I think it's important still. And I just put it up there as a, as a, you know, open it up so other folks know what I'm, know what I'm thinking, and getting the feedback from people too. So, and this kind of harkens back to some things we've talked about earlier in this conversation. But what is sort of the elevator pitch for that proposal? Well, you know, I, I mean, again, like I think that this question of data-driven education is, is uh, in some ways, it's it's a buzzword, but I do think that we're looking at a moment, an interest, really interesting moment in terms of the collection of data that we're able to do on students' interactions, um, and learners' interactions, I would say, because of computers. Um, and I think that we're only tracking on a certain amount of data. We're only tracking on the testing data. A lot of companies are starting to sell schools this adaptive learning and for these adaptive learning software, which is a data-driven product. And I think it's worth taking a deep look at what we mean by educational data, what we mean by analytics built on it, and what's going on and what's going on under the hood of all of these all of these companies, because these companies are raising a lot of money, and schools and universities are spending a ton of money on adaptive software right now. So Kickstarter? Maybe Kickstarter. Yeah, I could I could do Kickstarter, or I could put it on the back burner and <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> I got lots of projects. <laughs> okay, so more pepper spraying on a college campus? I am I was the stun, stunned to hear this. I mean, I don't know what what California, the California higher education system is thinking, but certainly, you know, pepper spraying pepper spraying student protesters when they complain about tuition hikes um, is is makes me very sad. And this but, wasn't just tuition hikes, right? Right. This the the tuition the 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 tuition the, the Santa Monica colleges implement or they aren't now, thankfully. But they were talking about implement implementing a two tier tuition scheme where if classes were sold out and 
classes are sold out now in community colleges because lots of folks are going back to school at the community college, you know, for job retraining and because of the economy. So cl popular classes required for graduation are sold out. And what Santa Monica College said is that if you can pay an additional tuition fee, we'll let you in, creating a two-tier sort of system that, benefited wealth, that would benefit wealthy students. Interesting. Um, a teacher's aide in Michigan challenges or suspension from work. Did you see the O'Reilly piece on this? I was trying to figure out who, trying to remember who wrote it. It was a different take on this whole Facebook password issue. I don't think I did. Oh, gosh, I'm going to be embarrassed here. But uh, essentially, he said, we're getting this story wrong. Um, if uh, uh, if somebody you're interviewing says they will actually give you your password, uh -huh. then uh, you are um, you should never hire that person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because what other data would they give up that would impact your operation? Yeah. I think I got that right. No, that, that, was, a, that sounds, was a really interesting twist on it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still was, shocked by this whole thing. Well, I mean, I know we've talked, we've touched upon this several times in the last few weeks now, but this, you know, this question of privacy, this question of, you know, uh, whether you're a teacher or a student, what, uh, what, you know, who's demanding access to your data? Um, at, and what are the what are the consequences? What are the repercussions going to be if you refuse? Uh, the movie Bully's coming out. Yes. And it went from uh, R rating to no rating to now PG thirteen. <laughs> yes, without changing anything. It's so great how the MP. <laughs> There's a documentary I can't think what it's called about the the MPA rating system, and it's fascinating. It's a fascinating look at, it, at how. Um, how it operates. Little tangent there, but I recommend it. Do you know anything more about Bully? Or I haven't seen. I haven't. I don't know anything more about it yet. Okay. Uh, the lawsuits in several states accuse colleges, professors, and librarians of copyright infringement for making materials available online. Yeah. So th this this these questions of copyright. Um, and you know the traditional publishers again challenge. You know. That this is where you know this is where I think boundless is right that we're seeing you know we're seeing this move to digital content what what are the, what does it mean when uh, when we make the move from a paper copy of a textbook which is sort of finite what there's one copy to to digital stuff which is um, you know infinitely reproducible um, but the fact that the fact that a librarian would be the, a copyright infringer by making that material available on e-reserves at the library seems a bit of a stretch, but we'll see what the courts say. Not a lawyer. You were happy with some news about the Google Art Project? Yeah, this is the 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 um, Google Art Project was initially one of the Google Labs programs, which um, you know Google. Google said that it was when Larry Page became CEO that they were shutting down Google Labs. They were going to focus only on the things that really mattered, right? Like artificial <laughs> goggles and self-driving cars. But but no, the 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 Google Art Project is very cool. It's um it's a it's sort of a um a, a virtual field trip into the greatest art museums of the world and. Um, they're expanding that. They're expanding the number of museums and the amount of content that they have. And um, Smart History, which is now part of Khan Academy, has helped um, uh, beef up some of the some of the the video content for this project, which is. Wait, so we're are actually giving some good credit here to Khan Academy. Well, there we go. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, social finance. This was really interesting to me because I love the concept. But to provide funding for tuition just didn't feel like the best use for me. Yeah, the the you know we're we're seeing all sorts of crowdfunding um, opportunities um, c come up now, and I think that um, you know finding something that matters to you and um, investing in it personally is is a is a pretty powerful is a pretty powerful gesture on t in terms of the person loaning the money. But I think having a social the, so the argument goes sort of having a social relationship with that investor um, perhaps it, it you know improves the improves the outcome. Um, 
I think that this 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 is an interesting project, and it it what it reminded me of is the way in which we're you micro fun, micro financing has long been done in the developing world, right? So this is akin to the Kiva project, perhaps, or Vitana, which is actually gives small student loans to students um, in the developing world. And I thought, how interesting that that this that 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 now we're, we're, we're turning to microfinancing for something that we used to associate with um, helping people out of, um, helping people improve their lives in other countries, that, that we would use microfinancing now here for, for student loan money. I thought that was just an interesting, an interesting shift. Google Scholar has a new metrics feature. Yeah, uh, Google Scholar is vanity metrics for, uh, for, for, for academics, so you can see sort of how influential your um, academic journal articles are, how how often you've been cited, how um, many times your name has appeared in other academic uh, journal <laughs> articles, um, and they've just sort of they're just beefing up sort of the way in which you can tell the actual reach of a scholarly journal based on these sort of metrics, which is really I think it's actually um, one of these things that might sort of challenge some of the um, some of the some of the, the the closed academic journals, right? If if you can, if your journal is open, if it's open access, if anybody can read it and share it and download it um, themselves, then I would. It, it seems logical that those those articles are more likely to be cited, um, more likely to be used in other other academics' work. Um, and so this, it'll be interesting to sort of see now that we're sort of opening up opening up these metrics. Um, if the open if open access journals be, Become or appear to be more influential than ones that keep that keep the content locked down. This felt to me like one of those great examples of a of a lever, mm-hmm. right? That you do something that um, creates a cascading set of events that are likely to result in there being a, a value and an interest for the authors and the publications to be open. Yeah, no, I I think that you know I think that again, but coming back to uh, our dear friend Larry Page. It, it will be interesting to see how much Google cares about these um, these sorts of things. This week, I actually don't know if I included it in my news roundup, but, but um, Google, uh, Google, the Google Google Books will no longer um, have indie bookstore resellers, um, and so Google Books, Google Scholar, perhaps not not quite as important um, to Google. Uh, so it's sort of how, how much how much can we trust the Goog to be to be the company sort of to help us help be this lever? I don't know. Mm. I've never actually used iTunes U, but a big milestone for them, and with some people saying that they don't like it. Yeah, this was there was a uh, an, a, a couple of um, milestones this week for for iTunes U, which had its. Had its revamp as part of the um, Apple uh, education announcement earlier this year. They sort of um, beefed up the the beefed up sort of the appearance of 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 iTunes U, particularly on on the iPad. Um, and this was this is actually a you know a, a pretty interesting in in a lot of cases OER resource. Um, not everything is openly licensed, but a lot of it is openly licensed on iTunes U. Um, and what well, this there was an interesting story uh about how schools are opting not not to put their material there uh and i don't i don't know how much of that is sort of remaining fears about making the content you know remaining fears that many universities have about not or uh, forbidding forbidding their professors to post their information in a public place um uh, the the article also suggested that iTunes U wasn't a sufficient LMS replacement which I'm not sure that Apple is uh, thinking on those terms yet, but it was. Um, but we'll see. I mean, I think the iTunes U is a is a is an interesting resource. I have my own beef with it, sort of like most Apple products being decidedly unsocial. But uh, but there you go. Pew Research report indicates that a fifth of American adults said they have read an ebook in the past year. That surprised me. Uh, you, because it was you thought more or less. No, I actually was surprised that that many had. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is you know this was uh, interesting news, and I think I think great good news for for reading, uh, good news for readership. I mean, it seems as though 
ebooks and among the, the, the you know any time that Pew does these sorts of um, research projects, there's also there's all sorts of fascinating um, fascinating uh, material to dig through. But it seems as though people who love to read and who have ebooks read more. They buy more books. They're reading more. they and it's like this. I think it's a wonderful sort of um, a wonderful moment for for the for the love of reading, which is a very different story than the sort of um, hand wringing that we're hearing about. Um, the sort of ebooks being the demise, the demise of the publishing industry. Yes, eighty-eight uh, percent of those who read ebooks in the past twelve months also read printed books. Mm-hmm. I qualify. Yep. Compared with other book readers, they read more books. I think I probably qualify. I know I read a ton. I know I read more now that uh, that I on my Kindle than I did before. Well, interesting. I not only read more electronically i read more in physical print than i've ever read before that yeah interesting interesting and then um they read more frequently for a host of reasons for pleasure research current events work or school Uh, i i've wondered if there's a connection between our ability now to communicate socially with other people and reading because for me reading although it's a solitary experience at the time really depends on my ability to have conversations afterwards and I've wondered if that facilitation of those conversations means that we're more interested in reading material because we know it's going to inform our discussions. That's that's actually really that's really an interesting to think about thing to think about, and I think of that in terms of the way in which um, Twitter, in particular, seems to be this interesting um, uh, c- gathering place to talk about pop culture events, particularly t- you know television and movies. And thinking about a number of really well-known sort of books that have had have been adapted to to the screen, whether the TV screen or film screen. So thinking about people actually spending a lot of time talking about talking about you know consuming literature in this way, um, I, I notice myself sort of thinking about you know thinking about sharing what I've read with folks more. I mean, the the, the only thing I compare it to is sort of being in school when you would talk, you know sort of with assigned reading forced to talk to classmates about it. I mean, it seems even, you know, and the, the, the book club, while a great idea, it's, I think the book clubs are still sort of a very small closed thing. I feel having the conversation with folks about, you know, the hunger games, for example, um, is something that I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have ordinarily done before this social element. A uh, report from the National Center of, for Education and Statistics seems to question this idea we have that No Child Left Behind has led to a decrease in the availability of arts programs, music and visual arts. That was a surprise to me. It was a surprise to me, too, although um, the the uh, there, the, I should say that, that, the thea- that theater arts have diminished a lot, but there was, were still um, that, that, that these programs haven't been gutted necessarily in the ways that I think we talk about. Although, you know, again, this, there's this interesting difference between your personal experiences and these national stories. Um, you know, I mean, my, you know, I think about my, my experience growing up playing, you know, doing band, for example, um, and my son, you know, not having an opportunity to do something like that in his school. So, yeah. Feels like maybe there's more to that story. Yeah. Uh, a third of high school students own an iPhone. I know. Wow. <laughs> Who are these students? <laughs> yeah, uh, I thought that this this was a really interesting. Although I should say that you know the the story the um, the story did note that that this change is in part due to the recent the that these students don't own. I would say the iPhone four S, the latest iPhone. They they likely own the three the iPhone 3G, which is now available for like $45 with an AT&T or Verizon, or with, excuse me, with an AT&T contract. So I think, you know, I think that, but I I do think that students are smartphone users and it was, you know, students or teens certainly do, uh, do have an Apple affinity, many teens. Fascinating. I'd like to see how many students on an Android phone? I would, I would, I would, I would assume that it's many, many more. Um, because I think that, you know, like I, I think that it's, you know, owning a, 
owning a smartphone of some sort now is sort of the that is the device that you that you get with a cell phone contract without without having to shell out you know the 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 two hundred dollars for a, a new iPhone. Okay, and then uh, sort of as a final story here, I, I've loved Etsy, and I'm really interested that they're providing funding for women to go to a hacker school. Yeah, this is great. Uh, I think that I mean, like, yeah, me too. I, Etsy, Etsy is a uh, one of my a wonderful website, and I this again part of this rethinking what we mean about crowdfunding, for example, and getting community um, community support for your own for your own projects or products. Um, they're they're offering uh, scholarships to get ten women to go to the hacker school, which is a three month long, pretty intensive um, developer boot camp in New York City, and they're paying. Paying to tr- to make sure that the that the ratio to help sort of change the ratio of engineers and the when they ta- when Etsy talked about this in its blog post announcing it they you know they talked about their own struggles in finding um, you know in recruiting women engineers on their own staff and I think that um, that this is something that a lot of you know that that Silicon Valley still very much suffers from is is this rate this is this sort of skewed gender ratio of 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 uh, in the in the tech industry, so putting their money where their mouths are and helping make sure to train to train some 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 women engineers. Audrey, great to have a full week of posts from you. Yeah, well, this is it was a, a good week. Well, uh, well, it was an interesting week. It was an interesting <laughs> week. <laughs> good work. Thanks again, as always. Thanks, Steve. Take care.